I wrote a book about 10 years ago on American literature in the 1920s. In the U.S., the 1920s was at the height of its racism. And some of the most important works of American literature, works that even are well known in France, say The Great Gatsby by Fitzgerald or the works of Hemingway, race is very crucial to them. So I began working on the question of race and studying the question of race, and I was struck right away by the fact that although in many respects people seem to think that race had become differently or less important in the 20th and 21st century than it was in the 1920s, in fact, race continued to play a crucial role, although now, in a certain sense, what was the racism of the 20s had been replaced politically by a new force, the anti-racism of the neoliberal period, our period. Anyway, above all was this, is that at the center of, of a certain notion of social justice in America, and I don't think it's just in America, I think it's in almost all liberal com countries right now, is a principle of anti-discrimination. The U.S. had been, for hundreds of years, a racist nation. In some respects, in some important respects, the U.S., Obama to the contrary notwithstanding, still is a racist nation. But, so it was crucial to show that the U.S. was seeking to overcome that racism. So you have anti-discrimination plays an absolutely central role. And anti-discrimination does two things. One, if it succeeds, then indeed you begin to get elites who are not just white males. And two, if it succeeds, it not only does not alter the, read it, the distribution of wealth, on the contrary, it justifies it. Because now you can say to the poor people, look, it's too bad you're poor, but you're not poor because you're a victim of racism. You're not poor because you're a victim of sexism. You're just poor because you couldn't make it in American society. Okay. It really, we can say almost incidentally, uh, it began with what you in French call discrimination positive, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the effort to get more people of color, above all, more African Americans into American universities, um, the way it managed to succeed legally was by appealing to the concept of, of diversity. That is, it was possible to argue that it would be better in the universities to have a more diverse population. And diversity then became very quickly a kind of at the center of a certain notion of American social justice. And indeed, what one saw very quickly after that was that the core idea was to diversify the elites of American society. So people began to feel a lot better when the graduating class at Harvard, which would be like here, a graduating class at Sciences Po, looked not just a bunch of white guys, but was black guys and white guys, and actually even girls, people of all different colors. So it was important to everybody that they'd seemed like this was more fair because, after all, everybody could take part. But, of course, people graduating from Harvard, like the people graduating from Sciences Po, had always been an elite. Mm. The difference now was that the elite came in lots of different colors. Mm. Egalité des chances, in English, equality of opportunity, is above all, has nothing to do with trying to establish a more equal society. It has to do, instead, with trying to justify the inequalities you've got. If you live in a society where you are unable to succeed because you're a woman, uh, you're unable to succeed because you're black, you've been the victim of an injustice. American society today seeks to recognize that injustice. But what we then want to say is, okay, you had a chance. If you had a chance, no one's prejudiced against you because you're a woman, because you're black, you had the same chance as everybody else to succeed. Mm -hmm. But if you fail, it's on you. It's not our problem. Mm -hmm. So the great thing that Egalité des Chances does for any kind of uh, liberal capitalism is it, is it succeeds or it tries to persuade poor people that they deserve their poverty, although in my experience they don't actually believe it. And it also tries to justify to rich people that they deserve their wealth, and actually they all do believe that. So it's important to remember meritocracy as a word was invented by an Englishman in the 1960s, and it was meant to be um, he thought of it as a really, really bad idea. That is, what he was, he wrote a little novel, and the novel was about how bad a world would be if the world were organized so that everybody was treated according to what somebody thought were their merits. And you can see right from the start 
that really the whole point of meritocracy, the whole point of treating people according to their merits, is precisely to reward some and, and, and punish others. But if you think about it this way, in America, the jobs, we have a Bureau of Labor Statistics that predicts what kind of jobs there will be for people 10, 20 years down the road. The fastest growing job today in America is what we call home health care aid. That's someone who comes to your house, helps take care of you if you're old, who helps you get to the bathroom. Now, in America, those people make about $19,500 a year. You cannot live on $19,500 a year. The good jobs, the jobs you go to college for, those jobs are not increasing. The jobs that are increasing are these bad jobs. So suppose you have a completely meritocratic society, a society where everybody, people who do best on the exam, on the tests, they become doctors and lawyers, they make a lot of money. The people who get two or three points lower, they get to go uh, uh, change people's bedpans for $19,500 a year. What you have is a society in which the vast majority of people have bad jobs that are badly paid jobs that and and with with no health protections themselves but they're being told don't worry about it it's totally fair because you've got two points lower than this other guy who's now a lawyer and making six hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. so you want to say that doesn't create a more just society that just goes back to what we we're talking before all that does is make the people who are making a lot of money feel virtuous because after all they deserve the money they did two points better on the test and it makes the people who are changing bedpans for nineteen thousand dollars a year feel like they too deserved it my own view is that no one will ever feel they deserve that and they're right they don't deserve that a just society is not a society that awards everybody according to some idea of their merits, a just society is a society that creates more equality for everybody in some respects regardless of their merits. One of the things that's important to see, and this again is more true in the U.S. than elsewhere, but is also increasingly true in France, and has been true in the United Kingdom, and even in Germany, is that this entire commitment to diversity um, and the sense that the only form of justice that mattered was anti-discrimination has taken place during a period in which um, economic inequality has grown tremendously. If you look at any of the numbers, you will see that the highest point in American history of economic inequality was in the 1920s, late 1920s. Now that's been exceeded today. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a discourse which says that social justice consists entirely in trying to make sure that no one's the victim of discrimination because of their race or their sexuality or their gender, and that that discourse of social justice completely ignores the fact that an increasing number of people are in fact the victims of inequality. Indeed, in the U.S. since about 1980, people of the majority population is poorer than it once was. So on the one hand you want to say, look, the good news is that there's much less discrimination on the other hand, you want to say the bad news is that there's much more economic inequality and, in fact, that there's even more poverty. Mm. A lot of the problems around diversity and anti-discrimination have sort of circulated around the question of, of stereotyping, racial, ethnic, even gender stereotyping. But, you know, from my point of view, the great advantage of the notion of class is that it takes the question of how you think about others and it makes it irrelevant. So, okay, you're a woman, I'm a man. Supposing I actually think that you're somehow inferior because you're a woman. Supposing I think that you shouldn't be able to do certain kinds of jobs because you're a woman. Supposing I have all these bad stereotypes about women. What the notion of class does is say, and what the notion of equality of class says, is it doesn't matter how I feel about you or how you feel about me. It's not a question of how we look at each other. We're not looking simply to respect each other more. We're not looking simply to think better of each other. That you, as a member of this society, have a right to a living wage in this society. Whether you're a woman, whether you're beautiful or not beautiful, whether you're brilliant or not brilliant, you have a right to a kind of support that will make it possible for you to be an active citizen in society. So from my standpoint, the great advantage of a real effort to produce equality of class would be 
to render this question of stereotyping, to render the question of respect, to render the question of how we feel about each other much less relevant. You know, in the end, if I'm, if I'm poor and you're rich, I don't want your respect, I want your money. And that's more important. Mm. I mean, Obama's election obviously does testify to the uh, increased commitment to diversity. And one could add other things too, and again, as in France. I mean, when we're talking now, there's this huge outcry over uh, uh, le mariage gay. Mm -hmm. And you know in the U.S. as well, this has been a central issue. If you think about it in the U.S., or probably in France too, if someone had said 20 years ago that now there would be on the agenda homosexual marriage. If you said that in the U.S. 20 years ago, people would have thought you lost your mind. Why has that become so comparatively successful? Precisely because it does testify to our commitment to um, increased anti-discrimination. Now, if you compare that with the health plan, the health plan actually involves something more than anti-discrimination. It actually involves some redistribution of wealth. Now, it's actually the case that Obama's health plan involves very, very little redistribution of wealth. Mm. It's a striking fact that, give him credit, he has tried to do it. It's a more striking fact that many, many people who gladly would support Obama, many, many people who gladly support gay marriage, many, many people who think of themselves as politically on the left because they completely are committed to anti-discrimination have absolutely no desire to for their money, the money that they think of themselves as having earned to be spent on somebody else's health care. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, the U.S. not only remains a very conservative nation, but actually as it's become more committed to diversity and anti-discrimination, it's actually become more conservative with respect to the problem of class. Mm -hmm. It's not clear, 13.2 percent of the American population is African American. What good does having one of them be president do? It's made no difference whatsoever for them. If Obama had actually pursued policies which would make the poor less poor and make the rich less rich, then because so many of the poor are African American, it would have done them so good, some good. But in fact, Obama's presidency has done nothing for African Americans, not because He's prejudiced against African Americans, obviously, right? It's done nothing for African Americans because it's done nothing for poor people. And as we know, African Americans are different. African Americans are disproportionately poor in the U.S. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to do something for the African American population in the U.S., the best possible thing you could do would be a color blind. Don't worry about anybody's color. Just give lots of money to poor people. That would help African Americans. Obama has shown no interest in giving lots of money to poor people. He's been very, very good at, um, what, saving the banks, that is the rich people, and killing people with drones in, uh, mm. in the East. You know, I should say, I've, I've, I've always loved France. I come here often. I used to study French literature. And one of the things that one likes about France is that it's not, in many respects, like the United States. So I'm sad to say, that in lots of respects, it's becoming much more like the United States. Um, if you look at the data, Camille Landé is an economist who's worked on this in France. If you look at the data about French inequality, French inequality is growing. If you look around you, you can see just with your eyes that the increase in chômage, the increase in, in poverty in the banlieue. And, and you can see, and this is the most distressing part, that in France, increasingly, the response to those problems is not actually to deal with the question sociale, to deal with the, the problem of inequality of classes. The response is the American response, diversity. Mm. As if, if you take a few kids out of the banlieue and you enable them to succeed, that would create more equality. Mm. That doesn't create any more equality at all. It just takes the elite, and the French elite is currently primarily white, and primarily male, and it adds some women and some people of color, but it leaves it just as elite as it was, and it leaves the vast majority of the population in the banlieue and elsewhere completely untouched and unaided. Mm. In the United States, we didn't have to change the words. We never had much of a language to describe people who were exploited, <laughs> and we still don't have any language to describe people who are exploited. So yeah, I see the point of the French, I hadn't even thought of that. But as I say, in the U.S., 
there's always been a strong sense. You know, the U.S. has always been a country where everybody identified themselves as belonging to the middle class. And one of the reasons there's never been a successful left in the U.S. is because it's obvious that rich people don't think of themselves as exploiters. But we have always in the U.S. managed to convince poor people that they weren't in fact exploited. That's what's called the American dream. You know, when you started out, the first question you asked me was about um, how I started teaching, how I started getting interested in this. I said I was writing on American literature of the 1920s. So perhaps the most famous text of the 1920s is The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is famously about what every American child learns from the time he or she can first open his or her mouth, the importance of the American dream. The American dream is what? You can start out poor and get rich. That dream is not true now. And you're better off if you want to start out poor and getting rich, moving to Berlin, learning German. There's more social mobility there. But the truth is, it's never been very true in American life. The great success of American capitalism has been convincing people that it was true, that they never were exploited, they just were taking the chance on their dream.